coming to you from Crosswinds International, and today we've got uh, the part four of our message, What Does Divine Favor or Walking in Divine Favor? Today is What Does Divine Favor Look Like? And I have a subtitle to that that God gave to me, My God Still Plays in the Mud. So I hope you can understand that by the time this message is through, I, I know that you will appreciate that, that title. Turn with me to Psalms 1, 1 through 3, if you have your Bibles, if you're looking on here. Psalm 1, 1 through 3. It's a familiar passage of Scripture. But it tells you who God blesses, who the favor of God comes on. If you want divine favor, it's not just begging for divine favor. It's actually an obedience to God and the things that he says. He favors those who love him, and those who love him obey him. And so without that obedience, your life is going to be hard. Because without obedience, you're a transgressor. And the Bible says the way of the transgressor is hard. And I want to show you that in Scripture today. Not just reading Scripture, but show you what God does when somebody does not obey. Where they're not listening. Where they're doing their own thing and thinking that's okay. No, it's not okay. You can't do your own will and, and think God is going to bless it. You do His will. Now, this is a problem in our generation. People don't want to do the will of God. They want to do their own thing in His name. The Bible tells us that's an apostate people, a people separated from God, not in His divine way, and not, and not believers, because if they believed, they would do what he said, right? But when people do their own thing and think that it's okay, then what happens to them is that their way becomes increasingly difficult. I see young folks today coming up around us, you that have been on this earth more than 40 or 50 years, you know what I'm talking about. Young people, different generation coming up, and they're... I don't know why things are so hard for me. Well, I do. Ask somebody that knows. Now, God woke me up this morning to give me the finish and the finality of this uh, series of messages. And I want you to hear it. I don't want you to come in thinking, well, you know, I hope this is something that means something to me. If you have an expectancy in your heart, that you're going to hear from God, I promise you what he said to me, I'm going to say to you, and you will have, hear, uh, had, have, heard, have heard from him. Psalm 1, 1 through 3. Blessed is the man who does not walk in the counsel of the wicked. That is the world, by the way. Or stand in the way of sinners does what sinners do, or sit in the seat of mockers. That's people making fun of those of us who believe. But his delight is in the law of the Lord, and his law, in his law, he meditates day and night. That man will be like a tree planted by the streams of water, which yields its fruit in season, whose leaf does not wither, whatever he does, say that, whatever he does prospers. Whatever he does prospers. If you want the favor of God, he just gave you the ingredients. You can't be like the world, you have to come out. You can't do like the world, you have to do like him you have to imitate him and then you have to delight in what he says and you can't sit around mocking believers well I don't know if they're blind. listen 
If you got that trash in you, get that trash out. A believer believes in Christ, has been transformed by the renewing of their mind. They obey the Word of God. And though they might fall once in a while, God will lift them up and He forgives them of every sin because they don't wait to get forgiveness and forget to ask Him there and checked by the Holy Spirit immediately and then they say, God, forgive me. Can God still change men? Can He change hearts? Now let me say this to the church, the church here and around the world. If there are people around you that don't know God, God is still mighty to save. And there's nothing too difficult for Him. And there's not a heart in the world that He can't break, soften, change. But I want you to know that the adversary thinks that once he's got their mind, he's got their heart. But it isn't over. And as long as there are people of God that's going to intercede on behalf of people that are not where they need to be, there will be broken hearts and God will change and transform minds and save souls. Amen? God is mighty to save. That's one of the biggest things I've remembered about him. And he, he goes places you and I won't go. And that's where he found me. <laughs> In a place that you and I won't go. Romans chapter 8, verse 28. This is not to everybody. This is to believers only. If you're still lost, this does not apply to you. If you're doing your own thing, this does not apply to you. This applies to Christians. This whole book was written to transformed new believers in Rome. And it was written by the Holy Spirit through the pen of Paul or somebody that was with Paul. It says, and, you know, in the scripture, you know this scripture, right? Romans 8, 28. I don't have it there for quoting. But it says that all things, what's all things? Okay, see, the adversary wants you to have a doubt in your mind that all things work together for your good. It's time for Christians to kick butt and take name. It's time for us to stand up to the adversary and make him flee. If the Holy Spirit says to you that all things work together for your good because you are called according to his purpose, his purpose, say, all things are going to work together for your good. Doesn't mean that everything you, you encounter is good. There will be difficulties, as, as I said to you. One of my friends in ministry said, if you're looking for the favor of God, you're inviting uh, a negative source as well. Because every time God blesses you, Satan wants to show up and mess up the party. But you can mess up Satan's party because he's given us all power over all the power of of the enemy and nothing, nothing there, all and nothings. I love those. Nothing shall by any means harm you. Amen. I'm going to read this one to you before we get into it uh, real uh, deep. Exodus 9, verse 10 and tw uh, through 12. And they took ashes from the furnace and st stood before Pharaoh, and Moses sprinkled it up toward the heaven. And it became a boil breaking forth with blains upon man and upon beast. And the magicians could not stand before him, Moses, because of the boils, and the boils were upon the magicians and upon all the Egyptians. 
Can you imagine God saying, throw some dust in there? I'll take care of the rest. In verse 12, I want you to listen to this. And the Lord hardened the heart of Pharaoh, and he hearkened not unto them as the Lord had spoken unto Moses. Pharaoh wouldn't listen. You know, you can harden your heart. But I want you to know it's still God. The God that hardened that heart was doing it for a purpose. The people of God were in bondage. And they have gotten so used to bondage that they thought that's all that mattered. That was the way it was going to be from now on. Until God started going in to deliver the, the people that wanted to come out of that bondage and know a life beyond the making of bricks and the beating of, uh, uh, by the children of, the, of Egypt. God uh, prepared a man to go in and he was actually rescued for the purpose in the beginning. Somebody that shouldn't even existed. The gators should have had, had him as a lunch. But God set him right in the house of Pharaoh. And then it was this man that was going in and was going to change an entire nation. And I'm going to show you some things that happened as a result of that. When you're talking about the divine favor of God, you've got to look at those that he's called according to his purpose. Because it's through their hand that favor will be given to men. And if you think it's any other way, I'm going to show you some things that will change your mind, okay? What does divine favor look like? This is our part four. And so we're going to look at this. God's favor can bring a lot of blessings upon a man. Divine favor can do, number one, it can produce supernatural promotion and in, in, in increase in Genesis chapter 39, verse 21, in the New International, it sounds like this. The Lord was with him, and he showed him kindness and granted him favor in the eyes of the prison warden, Joseph. Joseph suffered. He actually was false accused. You can't imagine Satan falsely accusing somebody that belonged to God, but yes, he was falsely accused, thrown in prison, and then God raises him out of the prison and makes him uh, the prime minister of all of Egypt. And he was able, because of the favor of God upon his life, to cause favor to fall on all of those that would have starved to death in a day where there was a great famine in Egypt and all of the Middle East. So God showed kindness and granted him favor in the eyes of the men that were giving him a hard time. Can you imagine that? When hard times come to Christians, listen to me, hard times do not come to Christians to make them sorry and sad. And I want you with me to say this, when hard times come and people say to you, how are you doing? Here's what you say. Like all of these men that I've learned from in the, in the Bible, all is well. I read that to you when we were looking at the, uh, the woman that lost the son. And she ran to Elisha last week in our message. She said to him when he was asking questions, how is it with your husband? How is it with you? How is it with your son? And she said, all is well. How is it with you, church? All is well. And when you know that all is well with you, it's because you know who is on your side. And if God be for you, what? Who can be against you? And there is nothing the adversary can bring against you to cause you harm. Actually, Peter says he can't touch you. 
if anything gets through, it's because God let it through. If he causes you to suffer something, it's because he's causing you to, uh, to rise up to reign with him. And it will be a testimony. You overcome by the blood of the Lamb and the what? Word of your testimony. So I want, as we're going through these people, I, I'm going to try to rush through this, and then we're going to uh, come to a conclusion and help you to see what God does that brings favor into your life, okay? Second, brings restoration uh, of everything that the enemy has stolen from you in Exodus 3.21. And I will make the Egyptians favorably disposed toward this people so that when you leave, you will not go empty-handed. Now, when God does a thing, he's going to prosper the people so that they have what's necessary, not only gold and silver and things like that, but they would have bread and food and, you know, understand that God is the one that is causing somebody that was an enemy to have his heart broken by the death of his own firstborn son. And now he wants the, the Israelites out of Egypt. And when they're on the way out, the Israelites had been so good in bondage that the people of Israel began to favor uh, Moses and the, and the children of Israel. They favored them. They started giving them gifts and gold and food, and they had everything they needed to make the journey. They did, the ones that didn't have sandals were given sandals, and not just sandals, sandals that would last them 40 years in the desert. Can you imagine that? I'd like to find a pair of shoes that would last me 40 years, wouldn't you? <laughs> On carpet. Yes, amen. So God favorably disposed the people's heart. He changed the heart of people toward his people. And listen to me. We live in a dark day, but the light shines on us, and it's shining through us. And though there are people out there that are mocking and all of that, living in sin and doing the things they do, what they're doing is going to catch up the, with them. But what God's going to do is all of that that was taken from us through the years will be given back and then some. God is going to, it's his good pleasure to give us the kingdom of God. It's his good pleasure to give us the kingdom of God. Okay? When you're in, in somebody's enemy territory, you got to hear this one too. He brings honor in the midst of adversaries. In Exodus 11.3, the Lord made the Egyptians favorably dis uh, disposed toward the people, and Moses himself was highly regarded in Egypt by Pharaoh's officials and by the people. So Pharaoh hated him, but his own people favored God's people. So God is able to take and put favor in the hearts of men. Listen to me. You've got to hear this. God is the one that changes the hearts and the minds of people. You can't say you can talk yourself blue in the face and not change anything. But when God, if you go to God and say, God, you who have changed the hearts and minds of people in the past, you have promised that you would continue, you would still do those things for us because you never change and and there's you're not a respecter person. Thank you, God, that you're going to change the heart of those people or the mind of those people. How many of you have ever been hardened about something and then God come along and change you? He changed your heart, changed your mind, 
You were going to do one way, and God changed you in your direction. Changed, changed the way that you even thought about it. I remember a prophecy that God gave me long years ago that he said that he was going to kick the bushel basket off of me in days ahead, and then I would look at people that had been foul and, and, and uh, you know, just mischievous and, and ugly toward me and that kind of thing, and then I would look at them and I would see a difference in them. And he said, you would say, well, how those people have changed toward me. But that wasn't what it was. He said, it's the changes I've made in you that's making the changes in them. And so he said that I will send them. And he did. And when people said it couldn't be, it was. I have a history full of that. God making sure that people saw that he was doing the work. So God uh, changes the hearts of people to give them that favor and, uh, and, and be favorably disposed and love the people that the leadership hates. Well, look, this nation hates about half of this nation, the Democrats. Uh, I'm sorry, did I say that out loud? The Democrats in this country had turned against God, against Christians, and Christianity. And they, they want to do everything that God says not. And they want to feed somebody that won't work. They want to kill children in the womb. They want us to pay Christians that work to pay people to do things and, and get things that they don't work for. And I'm going, yep, Satan's got your mind and your heart. But before it's over, remember this. God is going to use his people to be a light in, in a dark place. And there's going to be an incoming of souls into the kingdom before he returns. So God is going to change the hearts. Don't, don't give in to these things, that the overtures of Satan right now. Number four, God produces increased assets. In Deuteronomy 33 and 23, it says, a bat about Naphtali, he said, Naphtali is abounding with the favor of the Lord and is full, say full, of his blessing. In other words, the favor of the Lord came upon him. He was able to bless others. So it doesn't stop there. And it, and it says, he will inherit southward to the lake. God was giving him a lakefront property because he obeyed God. And when God blessed him, he blessed others. And because of that, now you don't know who Naphtali is. He's the sixth son of Jacob and the second son of Billah. He was the founder of the Israelite tribe of Naphtali, and his name meant my struggle. In spite of his struggle, he chose to believe God. He continued to bless God's people, and with that, he had the favor of the Lord, and God caused him to inherit the, all the southward to the lake. In other words, he had a huge piece of property and a big lake to boot. I, don't, I can't imagine that. Could you imagine how pe people would be jealous about that? That God blessed you and they didn't get a blessing because they sat around and they didn't do what God said? Okay. I, I need to go on. Five. Give great and unusual victories against impossible odds in Joshua 6, 20, 10, 9, and, and, and 20. It, and it says here, I know you, that's very small for you to look at, but when the trumpet sounded, the army shouted, and the sound of the trumpet, when the men gave a loud shout, the wall collapsed, so everyone uh, charged straight in, and they took the city. Not only the city, do you remember? They took the properties the gold, the silver, the food, the cattle, the 
what did they lack? They had to get through that place before they could go to the promised land. So on the way, there was a battle, but the battle belonged to the Lord, and all they had to do is not be lazy picking up the, the booty, the, the, the stuff that was spoils. Okay, yeah, we have to be careful about those words today, right? People change those words. Anyway, Joshua 10 and 9. After an all-night march to Gilgal, Joshua took them by surprise. God gave them victory after victory. Everywhere they went from that point forward, the enemy fell before them. Can you imagine this? And Joshua 10, 20, he says, So Joshua and the Israelites defeated them completely, but a few survivors managed to reach their fortified city. Everywhere they, got, they would go, they were defeating the enemy. Does God want you to defeat enemies? Absolutely. So you've got to understand, he gives, God gives unusual victories to those that live for him. Six, he gave recognition and promotion even uh, when you seem to least likely, not the least likely one to receive it. In 1 Samuel 16, 22, talking about David, that Saul went to Jesse saying, Allow David to remain in my service, for I am pleased with him. Now, the, the brothers, he rejected. The father was going, Well, he's just a scrawny little boy just taking care of my sheep and a handful of sheep over there. And they were making fun of him. But Saul took him in. He anointed him to be king of all of Israel. And he went, just like Joshua, and he stood be before a, a Goliath that was cursing Israel and, and making fun of them. And God gave the ability to a child, no less, to go out and kill a giant. I would call that favor. And then... The child chased the enemies, the Philistines, all the way to the borders and killed a bunch of them. You know, and that, they sang songs about him. David has killed, I mean, Saul has killed his thousands, but David is tens of thousands, which made King Saul very jealous. Listen, people can't stand you to be blessed. But God wants you to be blessed in the midst. Remember this. God prepares a table. It's prepared for you in the presence of your enemies. God prepares a table before you in the presence of your enemies. Why would he do it otherwise? God wants to provoke them to jealousy. He wants them to begin to have to reckon with the kind of life they're living, and he wants them to be able to receive just like you. So he has to shine that light in their face right at the table. It's a good thing. Don't get upset that you got enemies. God's using you to reach enemies. Isn't that why he sent us like sheep before wolves? Amen. Seven, produce prominence and preferential treatment. This is an Esther, a favor and kindness. In Esther 5, 8, it says, And if the king regards me with favor, if, he pleases, uh, if, I, if it pleases the king to grant my petition and fulfill my request, let the king and Haman come tomorrow, to the banquet that I will, I will prepare for them. Here's, here's somebody that's just coming into the house, and she's going to prepare the banquet before her enemies. Then I will answer the king's question. <laughs> Listen, God gave her a sense of favor even with the king who could have done away. I mean, he had just done away with a wife because she wouldn't come to a banquet for everybody to see her beauty. But when he did away with her, 
then God play, replaces her with somebody that was going to be over the, uh, the children of Israel, the Hebrews. And when there was all kinds of opposition against the Hebrews, God raised up one woman. This is, wait a minute, God places favor on women too. Amen? So let me go uh, and, and look at that again. To get petitions granted even by ungodly civil authorities. Remember, Haman had a petition that was written up to kill all of the Jews and had the king on his side until Esther came in. Can you imagine somebody that's beautiful comes in that she has gripped the heart of the king so that, that when she says to him, well, you'll have to kill me too. What are you talking about? Well, I'm a Hebrew. And Haman has caused you to re uh, write an edict to kill all of the Hebrews. Now, what are you going to do about this, O king? Well, she had the king's heart in her hand. And all of a sudden, he changes the petitions, and he granted her her petition. Can you imagine that? God even turns the enemy so the enemy has to, uh, to rule in your favor. I remember once when we had some government officials that were chasing us around that w did not want us to be able to do what we do today. Nevertheless, we went to Savannah, and I was doing some petitioning of God on that little trip that we took. And then the Lord said to me, and I said to y'all on Sunday morning, that Sunday before we came back, that the enemy that we saw today, that was the one scripture that he gave to me, and I remember it like it was yesterday, you will see no more, and we have not seen them since. When God says it, it's going to happen. So, you know, God has, God has a way about him, doesn't he? Let's look at this. Changes the rules, regulations, even laws if necessary to, uh, to your advantage. This is what God changes in the heart of a king. It's 8.5. It's if it pleases the king again, she said, if he regards me with favor and thinks it right thing to do, if he is pleased with me, let an order be written overruling the dispatches that Haman, son of Hamadatha, who slapped that mama, that Agag Agagite uh, devised and wrote to destroy the Jews in all the king's province. Listen to me. Not only did he write a, 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 an appeal or an overruling petition to dispatch, but he... Uh, Haman had built a gallows for all the Jews to be hung on. And then the, after the party was over, uh, the king goes out and he has Ham Haman taken to the top of the gallows and Hangin, Haman hanged on his own gallows that day. Can you imagine that God not only routs our enemies, but he will destroy them? If they don't repent, they're on the destruction list, and God will take care of that. Number 10, wins battles that you didn't even have to fight because God will fight them for you. In Psalms 44 and 3, it says this, It was not by their sword that they won the land, nor did their arm bring the victory. It was your right hand, your arm, and the light of your face, for you loved them. He's talking about the Lord. God gives victory to people that are on his side, that seek his will, that do the things that he says. I hear people today that they're afraid to say, your will be done. Well, what else is there? Disobedience? It's either his will or it's disobedience. Okay? So I think this is going to sum some of this up for you. Deuteronomy chapter 30, verse 8 through 10, 
And, and, and it says this, And you shall again obey the Lord and observe all his commandments which I command you today. Then, say then, then the Lord your God will prosper you abundantly in all of the work of your hand, all the work of your hand, and in your offspring of your body, and in the offspring of your cattle, and in the produce of your ground. God was going to bless everything their hand touched. Does that sound familiar? Okay. For the Lord will again rejoice over you for good, just as he rejoiced over your fathers. If you obey the Lord your God to keep his commandments and his statutes, which are written in the book of the law, if you turn to the Lord your God with all your heart and soul. Now that really sums up what favor is and how it gets to you. So, what's the common denominator? It's one word. Man. God used man to bless men. He blessed men when he sent a Moses or a David or a Ron Powell or a David Savit or a, a Jay Watson or a Daniel Savit. It, you know, it, he used men. And, and he used a few women, Esther, and Sheila, and uh, Terry. What was your name? <laughs> April. <laughs> so listen, God will use you to be the favor bearer. But the one that the favor comes upon has to, has to agree that they have to go into the face of an enemy. And in the face of an enemy, not to fear because no harm can come to someone who is doing business. Listen, Moses stood up right in the face of, of Pharaoh. Throw, <laughs> he's, he's hardened his heart, and now he throws up in the air some of the dust out of the furnace. And everybody in Egypt that was against the, the Hebrews and the Israelites every one of them came down with boils from the top of their head to the soles of their feet. And the animals. God causes us to triumph over our enemies. He does that for the, the purposes of changing the heart. Now again, I want to paint a picture for you. Leaving now, Egypt, the people of God was still had Egypt in their heart, and God had to get rid of a few all along the way. And then, but going right to the, to the edge of the sea, listen to me. Why did God change the heart of Pharaoh again to chase after the children? Because they would have stopped and settled right there on the seashore. But that wasn't the promised land. It didn't have his plan written on it. These things were before the world began. Everything that we're going through has already been planned. Ours is to fall in line with the plan. We're not writing the plan. We're following the plan. God has set before us. And if you want the plan to work for you, you have to know that the favor of God is on you when you are doing those things that he said. Pray. Study. Show yourself approved unto God. Do the thing that he told you to do. Don't, don't wait. Don't delay. Don't drag your feet. Do it when he says it. It doesn't matter if everybody else doesn't agree and they can't call a committee. God doesn't need a committee. That's the biggest blasphemous thing that ever happened to the church of Jesus Christ was pe people are going to make a decision for God. Going to call a committee to see if we can do what God said? Do you understand how blasphemous 
that is to change the word of God we don't obey the flesh of men we obey his his edicts that come through his spirit and our heart through his word and that word never changes will judge every man forever ever ever but listen God used men to to harden hearts break hearts it was the same Pharaoh that lost his only son whose heart was deep in sorrow because his son lay before him dead because he didn't have the blood over his doorposts. But where the blood is, no harm comes to them. When we plead the blood of Jesus Christ, listen to me. The adversary comes to kill, steal, and destroy. When you plead the blood of Jesus Christ, he doesn't have any power over your house, over your body, over your family, over your finance. He does have no power. He's a liar. God gives you everything you need. He's the provider. Satan has no provision. He is stripped of provision. And all he can do is lie to you to steal, to kill, and destroy. This is the thing that the, the Christian needs to hear. That God has given you favor with him, and that gives you favor with men. And if they don't favor you, it gives you triumph over those men. The adversary is going to suffer great, great, great defeat at the hands of our God once again. But he's going to do that in the face of all of those that look narrowly on him and say, is this the man that caused all of the problems in our earth and in our lifetime? They can't believe you somebody that stripped of glory, that stripped of favor, had that kind of authority in the minds of men. Nevertheless, if you listen to God, you reject the overtures, anything that comes to you saying you, you're not going to get something from God, li listen to me. Y'all, listen to me. The promises of God are yea and amen. Yes and amen. If Something says you can't have it. It's not God. God said he would prosper us, give us long, satisfying life. He told us in his word that he, he, there wasn't any good thing that he would withhold from those that were called according to his purpose, loved him and called according to his purpose. Loved him, meaning obeyed him, and called according to his purpose. That is doing what he commanded them to do you don't write the book you carry out you were called according to that purpose that God listen it, it still works today all those that thinks it's changed through the years and God's changed somehow God can't change he's perfect all of his ways are perfect all of his words are to us just today, just like they were when they were written by the Spirit of God. And all of those words still come true to a believer who trusts in the Lord with all their heart, who do those things without reservation. God, our God, has caused men in his stead to do just like Jesus. Now listen, the Bible says this that in the earth we are as he is. We have his heart. We have his mind. We have his spirit. He reveals himself to those who seek him. He blesses those who do his will. He favors them with long life and health and anything that touches you. He rebukes. What did he say? All of those afflictions you will be delivered from by God. Right? All of our sicknesses. In Psalms it says, remember uh, those things that he has done for us. Those benefits uh, uh, that he has done for us. First, salvation. Second, healing. Third, 
redemption from destruction. That's what our God did for us. And if you don't want to follow the ones that are going to be overcoming all things, look, you can be alone out there with all of those that are going to suffer the perils with Satan himself. It's time for you to hear the Word of God. It's time for your hearts to be changed. And I ask God today, in the name of His precious Son, Jesus Christ, I ask Him to change hearts and minds of people that got this far in this message. Change the heart so that you can live with Him forever. Change your heart so that you can be blessed above the blessings of your adversary. Change your heart so that you can be healed of all of your afflictions and all of your sicknesses and diseases. God doesn't put those things on those. He promised that in Deuteronomy. He does not put sicknesses on people like He did on the people in Egypt because they're following Him. He will heal you of all your afflictions, all of your sicknesses. He'll save you from your despair too. And listen to me. If you didn't hear me, He will prosper and make all that your hand is set to be blessed. And it'll be blessed. And yes, you will have enemies. What is that to you? that's different than today. Don't you have them now? I'm sure I have a few. I don't, I don't hear them except in the Spirit. But God is for me and He's against them. And those that He's against are those that He's going to cause those diseases to come on. He will cause me to be able to influence people in law. And He has. And things have changed because of that over the years. I thank God that His Word is true. And it is true, and every man's a liar, as, as I'm concerned. If they're not in the Word of God, they're a liar. Amen. Thank you, Father, because all of them, all of them that heard this word to have to take counsel with you and have that hardened heart changed. Make a fleshly heart that can be touched again and change them. Run them down, Lord God. Cause your people, uh, your favored people, to go out in the anointing and, and to be there at the right place at the right time to cause people to come in and cause a great influx of people to come into your kingdom before your coming. And we ask this in Jesus' name and according to your own word. Amen.